On this episode of The Median, I talked to a history professor over at Marist College, a person that I personally took while I was over at Marist College, Dr. Michael O'Sullivan. We first talk about his brand new book that just came out, Disruptive Power, Catholic Women, Miracles and Politics in Modern Germany from 1918 to 1965. We then delve into the definition of populism and fascism throughout history and its application today. And lastly, we talk about the state of higher education, the cuts, the layoffs, and the things that are going on, and is there a potential way to fix it? So without any further ado, enjoy the show. How's it going, everyone? Welcome to another episode of The Median. I'm your host, Alex Cuesta. And with me today is someone who unfortunately had to endure me for a semester as a student. Um, he is a professor of history at Marist College, uh, one of the most underrated history departments in the nation. Uh, Dr. Michael O'Sullivan, uh, Professor O'Sullivan, how are you? I'm doing all right today, Alex. How are you doing today? Good, good. And I think you would agree that we have one of the most underrated history departments. I'm not just saying that because I graduated it, but top to bottom, the work that you guys do, not only um, while you're teaching, but on the side, um, doing your sabbaticals, researching, all this type of stuff. You guys are all tops in your selected fields in history. Am I wrong on that for the most part? (laughs) Well, I'm going to exclude myself from the praise and just say that my colleagues in the history department are... uh, it's a remarkable group of people. When I was hired there, um, one of the things I was most excited about was the, the makeup of, of, you know, the other people in the department. And in my, uh, I guess, 13 or 14 years, however long it's been at this point now, um, the, you know, I've never been disappointed in that. It's just a really a, a tremendous group of people. So I, I, I share your opinion. Yeah, I was definitely fortunate, even though I wasn't one of the best students, I was fortunate to be there. So I enjoyed getting everything I did out of it. And it gave me ability to research and critically think and do shows like this. And like I mentioned that our professors there are gifted and they do a lot of their things. Professor O'Sullivan is no exception. And he has a new book out. And I want to start off the show by touching on his new book, um, Disruptive Power, Catholic Women, Miracles, and Politics in Modern Germany from 1918 to 1965. And for those that don't know, there are very few people in the nation that understand that period of Germany better than Professor O'Sullivan. So (laughs) first, give a little synopsis because there's a lot in that title. So give a little synopsis on what that book entails and what you're trying to accomplish in terms of an explanation there. Thanks, Alex. And thanks for giving me the opportunity to be on the podcast. Um, the book, it, you know, it is an academic book. So on the one hand, it's trying to achieve some a- academic goals and it's, um, you know, to some readers might be viewed as, you know, uh, a kind of a narrow topic. But uh, I also, tr- you know, it's, it's a book that also is filled with pretty exciting um, anecdotes and stories. Part of what attracted me to the topic is it had these just colorful historical figures that I hoped would draw reader, you know, readers in. So even if someone um, wasn't interested in some of the academic points I was making, that some of the chapters could be um, just really interesting, you know, uh, stories uh, for people to read. But the book, in essence, is a book about a resurgence of faith in Catholic miracles in the Catholic regions of Germany during the 20th century. So the the it, 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 you know at its core and at its most simplest, the book tries to um, essentially kind of push back a little bit against the assumption that uh, Germany was a country that became very secular in the 20th century, where religion was no longer important, that it was, you know, a real rationalized society, and um, that, you know, even a movement, uh, you know, like the Nazi movement, for example, was not particularly connected to... um, the main Christian denominations of the country and so on. Uh, So, you know, it was surprising for me when I was uh, researching Catholic Germany and I discovered there were instances of uh, belief in the, in stigmata uh, and several instances where, you know, uh, usually young girls in the countryside were claiming to see visions of the Virgin Mary and that both of these types of things just attracted enormous amount of attention from kind of millions of Catholics in the country. 
So the the idea of the book is try to figure out, okay, to try to show, yeah, this was something that was happening that we didn't know about. And then the next step was, well, what does it mean? You know, uh, what, what sense can I make of it? Um, would you like me to go a little bit further, Alex? Or do you have uh, any questions? Um, well, I'm, I'm curious that when I see these types of topics and I did, I didn't get a chance to finish the book, I'm honest, but I did read a good portion of it. And with topics like this, you mentioned that it is a particular topic and it certainly is a particular topic. Um, what caused you to go on this research route? Was it something that you were reading that spiked you and said, I, you know, I don't know if I've seen enough academic scholarship on this. This is something that I'm interested in. Or did you see some scholarship in the, um, you know, positive way that, you know, arguing for the secularism of Germany during this time that made you want to push back against it. What was essentially your inspiration for writing this? It was one of those moments um, where as an historian, I was sitting in an archive in Germany researching an entirely different different topic. And I came across this file about uh, Theresa Neumann. Um, and she's probably the most important figure that I examined in the book. She was uh, someone who claimed to have stigmata, and she became something of a religious celebrity in Germany from the 1920s until her death in the early 1960s. Um, and so I opened up this file, and I read about this woman who you know, claimed to bleed from her uh, eyes, hands, uh, you know, forehead and feet you know, every Friday um, for decades, and who claimed to have visions uh, where she saw scenes from the Bible, where she, um, she would go into trances, where she'd uh, speak in the voice of, of Jesus. She'd, uh, you know, cl- claim to undertake all sorts of miracles where she'd, you know, suffer vicariously for someone else who was sick and cure them in the process. Uh, and millions of people came to see her and, and you know, read about her. And, uh, you know, lots of different people projected meaning onto her. So, you know, when I, when I saw that file, I just thought, um, you know, man, this is a really interesting story. And, not, you know, there wasn't a lot that had been written about it. Um, and, I, you know, so I, so I just thought, well, this is a story that needs to be told. And, you know, the next step was figuring out, well, what does the story of Theresa Neumann mean? And, and were there other instances like this? And there were, right? There were other instances of stigmata. There were, you know, these apparitions of the Virgin Mary. More and than how do, I could have imagined, how do I sort out quite what, honest. More than I could means. have imagined when scrolling through your book. Like, yeah. It was really <laughs> bizarre to see. And just quickly, for those that don't know what stigmata is, um, there was a movie made about it in the 90s, which I don't know if many people watch, but it's essentially someone that claims to go through the stages of suffering that Jesus Christ did during the crucifixion. So, yes. and I, I don't think there's ever been anyone that has gotten to the full um, crown of thorns or has claimed to gotten there. But, yeah. th- you know, it's been bizarre instances of the claims and it's basically words against others that's happening. So, um, sorry to interrupt, but yeah. Um, Continue on. Yeah, go ahead. Continue um, on what basically brought you to this. Yeah. Um, so I guess I, you know, I, you know, I was w- when I came away with what the contribution of the book is the, the other surprising thing that I or the other surprising things I found was that these weren't just kind of weird stories, but they really had connections to kind of like mainstream uh, German society and culture. So, um, you know, one issue is, you know, I was trying to talk a little bit about how Germany secularized. And initially I viewed the miracles as a sign that Germany was still religious. And in some ways it was, but uh, even though the people who believed in these miracles were intensely religious themselves, I kind of argue in the book that they um, unintentionally weakened the hold of the institutional church, uh, the institutional Catholic church in Germany, because they were, uh, none of them were sanctioned by the church ultimately. So they're all kind of rebellious and, you know, rebelling against their bishops and sometimes their priests. And you had Germans in the, in, in this tumultuous age of dictatorship and war and all these major changes from world war one to uh, Nazism, world war two, the cold war, uh, the economic miracle of the fifties and so on. Um, You know, they, they were drawn to um, these kinds of uh, spiritualities that existed outside uh, the usual you know, religious institutions. And there were, uh, my, my colleague, Monica Black, just put out a book on kind of secular miracle workers. And you have mm-hmm. these people, unaffili- you know, unaffiliated with religious traditions who are healing people and yep. 
you know, witches and these kinds of things. Um, you know, so it was just kind of in the spirit, uh, you know, of the time, but, you know, it kind of unintentionally weakened the Catholic church that these people claimed to, to, to represent and so on in the process. Um, so you, you kind of touched on it because the period that you brought up 1918 to 1965 is interesting because, like you said, they were a war-torn country from the First World War and Second World War, the kind of end of the First World War, and then it encompasses the Second World War where um, – did you kind of find that people were – turning to these types of things because they were very down people, because they were people that they were blamed for both world wars. Both conventions basically put all the blame on them, especially the first world war, which gave Adolf Hitler the ability to rise because he was speaking to a group of torn people and Germans. And, you know, for people that don't know their German history, they were a country founded on war through Otto von Bismarck, basically unifying them and saying, we just need wars all the time and we'll be good. <laughs> Essentially dumbing down his theory. But, um, so did you find that that had a big role to play in the belief of these people that they were just kind of so desperate and so pushed down by the rest of the world, uh, telling all of Germany, everything about these wars is your fault and you guys need to pay for it all. Did that have part of it? Yeah, I, th I think there was, um, you know, th this was a way to, to, to process trauma, especially. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Theresa Neumann herself, she, you know, she, she herself, uh, never went to the front or anything like that, but she uh, experienced a trauma herself or she suffered um, terrible injuries when there was a fire in her town and that uh, caused her health to decline, uh, her, both her mental and physical health, quite frankly, to decline rapidly uh, in the immediate aftermath of World War One. And she did seem uh, to attract, especially a, a type of Catholic who viewed World War One as a punishment from God for sinfulness for people who had uh, in, a, in a society that become too modern, too secular, and that the only, the, the only way to save the world from apocalypse was to find salvation and miracle workers like Theresa Neumann, you know, in, in this mystical realm that was outside the, the, the usual bounds of religion. Um, and then in the aftermath of uh, World War II, there were I, I, these themes of apocalypse in these visions in some ways became even more pronounced. You know, it was, you know, a people who had been through uh, Nazis and many of them had been devoted Nazis, you know, um, and, and they'd had, uh, you know, seen, seen the movement defeated and shattered. They, a lot of them fought on the Eastern front. Some of them were ethnic Germans who'd been expelled from uh, Eastern Germany after the war. Mm -hmm. uh, in the late 40s and early 50s, it wasn't clear at all that things were going to work out for the Germans, although they actually did work out pretty well for West Germany in the long run. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you, and you had these fears of nuclear war in the in the early days of the Cold War, you know. And so these they they were kind of angst ridden um, visions of apocalypse, very much connected to the this just tumultuous era. Yeah. All right. So if you're interested in finding out a chunk of history that isn't very much research, but definitely interesting if you're into kind of theology and kind of theological theory and how it jives with secularism, um, you know, a very like uh, Professor O'Sullivan said, a detailed topic, but a topic that I think is worth exploring. And when I could say his writing style, while detailed, he definitely adds enough anecdotal stories that it is extremely interesting for anybody to read. So I highly recommend going to get his book again, it's Disruptive Power, Catholic Women, Miracles and the Politics in Modern Germany from 1918 to 1965. Um, and with that, we're going to jump into our main first topic, the meat and potatoes of the show. Um, so how we're going to do this is, uh, Professor, I'm going to kind of talk about the topic, introduce it, and then I'm going to allow you to give your position, as I normally do with all my guests, and the debate will go from there and we'll have a good time. So um, as always, the guest gives me their topics that they would like to talk about. And the first one that Professor O'Sullivan wanted to talk about was he wanted to talk about the definition of populism and fascism throughout history and essentially its application to our current time. So you have the floor. Um, kind of give me your position on that and away we go. <laughs> uh, thanks, Alex. Uh, I appreciate you uh, allowing me to pick the topics. And I, uh, so I picked the topic of fascism and populism because it's something I've been teaching a lot about the last couple of years. And this is a topic where, uh, you know, a lot of my writing is, uh, we, we touched on earlier, is about 
you know, Catholic Germany in the 20th century. So I'm really reliant on a lot of the ideas that other authors have written about. So kind of um, a lot of my viewpoint is shaped by the people who I read. Uh, but because I, I teach about it, I've read a lot of stuff. So I guess, um, you know, the topic, you know, in, in some ways we've gotten caught in this interminable debate right now about fascism, right? And it's, yeah. uh, are we seeing a revival of fascism globally, right, is, is the main question, right? Is, um, you know, and, and certainly in the United States, a lot of this um, debate got focused on the figure of Donald Trump, you know, is Donald Trump a fascist or is he something else? Is it okay to use the term fascism? Um, is that disrespectful to, you know, the legacy of fascism and, and how damaging, you know, and, and genocidal Nazism was, but also just looking globally, you know, uh, you have this rise of far right politics, anti-immigration po- uh, parties in Europe, um, you know, uh, illiberal uh, leaders such as Viktor Orban in Hungary or Erdogan in Turkey or Bolsonaro in Brazil, Modi in India, you know, are these leader fascist? Are these leaders fascists? Are they populists? Can we put them all in the same tent? Right. How do we categorize what's going on right now? Um, so I just think that those are uh, interesting questions it's controversial. You know, I think a lot of people like to fight over this stuff and sometimes it can get a little bit silly when we're parsing these definitions. Um, so, so how would you personally yeah. define uh, populism and fascism as you see it? Good. And um, where would you bring that to today? Would you label um, Donald Trump uh, and the people that you mentioned as fascist or populist or blend the both? Good. Well, why don't I start with the definition? And if I forget to get to uh, the Donald Trump question, you can remind me of it, Alex, all right? <laughs> sure. Um, so the, the thinker who I ultimately have decided I like the most on this topic is uh, Frederico Finkelstein. He's an historian. He, uh, he's an interesting guy, uh, you know, in that he, my understanding of his background, I actually don't know him personally, um, is that he's from Argentina, but his, uh, he descends from a family of European Jews who migrated from Europe to, you know, Argentina fleeing fascism. Um, and therefore he's got a very interesting perspective in that he views fascism, not so much in a Eurocentric way, but in a more global way, right? Because he's very connected both to the Argentine tradition and also the German and Italian traditions of fascism and populism. And he, um, and, and, and this is what I like to do with my students is to look at his definitions, both of fascism and populism. And he's got this concept of, you know, he has this book, for, you know, about fascism and populism in history because he views them as political movements that kind of interact with one another. Uh, that you had an era of 19th century populism that laid some of the groundwork for the era of fascism in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. And that uh, the Holocaust made fascism kind of untenable globally um, after 1945. And so you have the introduction of a post-45 populism or a reintroduction, reinvention of populism is a way to uh, have a politics that contains some of the elements of fascism, but uh, in a very different form that could, that you could identify as different. And then he argues that sometimes in pop, you know, populism after 45 does in fact lead to then a new, wave of fascism, right? So it's like populism leads to fascism, leads to populism, leads to fascism in, in this cycle. But you, when you're trying to categorize specific leaders, then he gives you some criteria. And sometimes when things have certain similarities and overlaps, like it leaves room for the fact that maybe you consider one leader a populist, another a fascist, and they might still share some of the same qualities, right? And so, uh, so what is fascism to him? Um, you know, he, uh, he argues it was, you know, a very ultra, you know, at, at its core, it was a very ultra nationalist movement, you know, beyond kind of the nationalism in the 19th century, it, it was this hyper nationalist, hyper ethnic nationalist movement. Uh, it was a politics of us versus them, 
right? Uh, that um, left no room for negotiation or collaboration. Um, it was a politics of lies or myths rather than a politics of truth and rationality. Um, he viewed fascism as a political religion uh, that had kind of a messianic leadership cult. And in terms of economics, uh, I think he, he leans in this way. This is how most people would define fascism as being um, uh, a political movement that does believe that the government should regulate some aspects of the uh, of the economy, but also kind of was simultaneously, uh, you know, in close collaboration with the capitalist elite, offering a lot of protections and corruption that favored the capitalist elites. Now, all those things I listed, Alex, Finkelstein, he associates with fascism, but he also associates with populism, right? All those things he sees as being there actually in both movements. So what are the differences then, right? How can you go, how can you say what's populist and what's fascist? Well, the thing that takes fascist regimes to the next level is that populism, he argues, is inherently democratic. It relies on democracy for legitimacy, right? Whereas fascism is inherently anti-democratic and, and usually authoritarian and dictatorial, um, totalitarian in some cases. Number two, uh, fascism has violence as uh, something that is central to not just what, it, what its movements do, but it's at the center of its ideology. Um, and populists can sometimes have violent rhetoric, right? They might sometimes provoke incidents of violence, but... It, you know, in, in Finkelstein's mind, a populist does not have violence at the core of their political message. Right? Um, and the other major difference is that fascism is a movement of the radical right, right? Whereas populism is something that can exist on both sides of the spectrum. A populist can be a far right populist, but a populist can also be a far left populist, like uh, Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, for example, uh, you know, in, in Finkelstein's categorization, I believe, you know, he categorizes him as, as a populist leader. Uh, so, you know, what I like about his definition is it creates um, these features that you can look for and say, okay, yeah, that's fascism. That's populism. Sometimes they share the same features, but these are the ways in which we can distinguish them. All right. So, you know, that's, you know, it's a lot to break out there. And I did, you know, you recommended that you like um, Frederico Finkelstein. So his books are difficult to find on the apps that I use for audiobooks. I'm a big audiobook guy. So I took to grand old YouTube and I listened to a whole bunch of Finkelstein. So I ingested and I got a lot of what you just said. He parses out those definitions very well when he's speaking as well. Um, and it kind of brings to mind the questions of um, when he's kind of saying this and that one thing that I've heard, because I like to enjoy both conservative and liberal media. I listen to both because I like to get both sides. I obviously have a leaning one way or the other. That's neither here nor there. But one thing that I found is both sides have been throwing out the terms that either side is a fascist and both sides have been giving examples that I think Finkelstein when parsed out by both the thinkers, not just the ones that are just yelling it, ah, you're a fascist to one side or the other. When the actual scholars of each side are claiming it, they both have some legitimacy to their claims. And I think with his definitions of fascism and populism, you would definitely get a debate from some that he's parsing some words where I feel like a lot of people on the right would take a lot of um, uh, just offense in terms of basically saying that Hugo Chavez, not necessarily a fascist, but to just put him as a populist, because in the end, we did see that his reign ended up with violence. His reign ended up with the um, autocracy. And in terms of what you're seeing, um, and again, this is speaking from what a conservative would say, in terms of what you're seeing with um, rhetoric begetting violence. Um, a lot of conservatives will point to the movement of Antifa in the United States. And although their name stands for anti-fascist, um, thinking people can understand that just because you name yourself something doesn't mean that's what you are. And uh, they can argue that for the past summer, we have seen a summer of violence based off of um, very left wing thinking in terms of what Antifa has tried to accomplish in terms of a terror, not a terrorism tactic, but a tactic of we're going to get what we want if we're not getting what we want. We're going to burn cities down. 
And you have that going with Antifa. And I think another thing that a lot of conservatives would take offense with is that claiming fascism is a far right movement. When when you look at the roots of fascism with um, Gentile and um, even um, the Italian leader, Mussolini, yep. they both came. They are socialist thinkers. They both came from a from the socialist party and branched off. And fascism was seen as a cousin of socialism for a very long time. And uh, it's it's only been in recent history that it's been claimed as a far right movement to the extreme where both Mussolini and Hitler were looking at Franklin Delano Roosevelt and saying he could be the uh, American uh, fascist. And it's going with things like that that I think conservatives would have to take an issue with the way that Finkelstein is defining populism and fascism and um just in the end that it's really parsing words to kind of create in turn who he wants to be a fascist, a fascist and who he wants to be a populist, a populist. Yeah. Um, Let me take on uh, Alex. The last thing he said first, and if I miss some of the earlier stuff, please feel free to remind me of it. Absolutely. Um, But uh, you know, as far, you know, you certainly hear, um, this debated a lot in the media and certainly there are certain uh, conservative commentators who raise certain issues about fascism being, uh, you know, toward, toward, toward the, you know, possibly being, you know, on the left rather than the right. Um, historically, I regard that as actually categorically false. I mean, there's no doubt that Mussolini started out, you know, in world war one as a socialist, right. But um, his fascist movement was also undoubtedly on uh, the radical right of the political spectrum, as were the other fascist parties of the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. And that goes for, and, and the term fascism is coined, of course, by Mussolini, right? Um, and insofar as we can view it, I mean, there, there's another old debate about whether fascism is even a generic concept that can be replicated, or did it just simply describe Mussolini's movement, right? Yeah. But um, that's... Um, that that debate in some ways is 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 a little bit dated at this point, but it's still one that that sometimes can be discussed. But I mean, when, when Mussolini was in power, um, who were the political opponents that he was imprisoning? Right, they were social democrats. Right, um, you know the the the, the fellow politician uh, who he murdered in the early 1920s, or not he personally, but whose murder he ordered. Um, as he was consolidating par- power, was the leader was the leader of the social democratic movement, um, and uh, certainly there were right of center politicians who were persecuted by fascists too. Usually, um, Catholic or Christian Democrats who were committed to liberal democracy, but by and large, it was the right of the political spectrum, even if they were not a part of these fascist movements, who often lined up behind them. And it was the left of the political spectrum that they challenged. And people who lived in Europe or Argentina or any of these other places in the world that had fascist movements in the 20s, 30s, and 40s had no doubt, right, about which end of the political spectrum these fascist movements uh, were on. So what sometimes winds up happening is, in my opinion, is a little bit of playing around with historical terminology. You know, for example, um, you know, the, the Nazi party was the National Socialist Party, the National Socialist uh, German Workers Party, you know, was the, was the full title. And so people will say, well, they had socialism in their name, so they were socialists. Uh, and, and there was, you know, a legacy of populist economic politics in this party. There's no doubt about that. But there's also no doubt about that the, the fact that the arch rival of the Nazi party in Weimar Germany was the Communist Party. And then the party that they... Uh, were had the second greatest antagonism with was the Social Democratic Party, followed by the centrist liberal parties, followed by the Catholic Center Party. And the parties that they were able to get along with were uh, the you know the, the more traditional parties of the right, which at the time were made up of monarchists and, and, and big business elites. Um, so this charge that fascism is, was somehow actually on the left of the political spectrum is one that I do, I, I think is you know largely an ahistorical claim. Um, another thing that you had to say about left-wing political violence is certainly one that, 
uh, merits some commentary, right? And so Finkelstein categorizing, for example, Hugo Chavez as a populist, and I, I hope I have that right, and I'm not misrepresenting his book, but I'm almost positive he has Chavez categorized as a left-wing populist. Um, you know, uh, you can still be a populist and be responsible for terrible things. You know, it's, uh, you know, you can be included in the category that's different from fascism and still be responsible for bad things, you know? And, um, I think a more, if if you're looking for a politically balanced way to look at this, like what is the comparable thing on the left, right? that you could use to balance out your critique of the right when you talk about fascism being a right-wing movement. Well, you can look very easily historically, certainly in the 20s, 30s, and 40s to totalitarian communism, right? I mean, Stalinism was the the, the violent ideology of the left that, w- that was um, incredibly politically violent. Now, could you categorize Stalin as a fascist? Well, no, because you know, he wasn't an ultranationalist, you know, you know, he, he was more, uh, he had an ideology that was more bound up in class. Um, he didn't have an economic philosophy that um, gave a lot of protections to the capitalist elite. Uh, but, you know, he was a Thor, he, he had some of these other um, qualities, right, that, that there were some things in common between what he did and what fascists did. But he doesn't, you know, Stalinism doesn't fall onto the populist fascist uh, kind of dichotomy. Rather, the term the, his, the, the term that has been used, uh, you know, to, to categorize this political violence of the left and the right is totalitarianism, right? And so, and totalitarianism can function as this term that describes features that are shared between fascist regimes and uh, authoritarian communist regimes, right? Um, that they, you know, that they have, they are kind of a political religion, that they are authoritarian, that they, they practice political violence, but then they have these differences between them that make, you know, that, that you can distinguish between communist and fascism, one being on the left, one being on the right. Um, so that's kind of how I would manage this desire to, um, you know, if if you're looking for historical balance between left and right, that's where I'd look for it. Not, uh, not that I think, you know, Hugo Chavez um, was someone who uh, left Venezuela in very good shape, but I do think his categorization uh, as a populist uh, fits, you know, relatively well. Um, You know, certainly there have been, you know, it's not that populists practice democracy the way, um, those who believe in liberal democracy want it to be practiced, right? Whether it's a populist on the right or left, they use democracy, but they but they also abuse it. And I think that's inherent in the term. Like, if, if you think Viktor Orban, for example, is a right-wing populist, you know, you could also say, well, he's screwed up their electoral system, so it's not really fair, right? Um, you know, so it, it's not populists rely on democracy for, for legitimacy, but they still... Um, you, you know, they're still um, ruining democracy in certain ways also. Um, so I'm just going to get to the elephant in the room because you're talking about categories. And I remember listening to certain things that Finkelstein had to say, mm-hmm. and he talked about Donald Trump. And he mm-hmm. didn't put Donald Trump in the category of fascist, but he put him in a wannabe, would be if he could be fascist category. Yeah. Um, what in your eyes, and what did you see from Finkelstein, if you agree with him or not on this, would put Donald Trump in that category, that if he could be, he would be, because if you look back on the history of Donald Trump in terms of who he's been throughout his history, the guy voted Democrat up until he basically ran for president. So uh, what would that distinction be, and what does that say about our politics in this country if a guy can be a Democrat his whole life and then switch uh, what what makes him a fascist wannabe in a way, I guess? Yeah. Well, it, it, you know, in that, um, the, the switching sides in fascist history is actually not that uncommon. You know, Mussolini was a socialist and uh, 
one of Hitler's recent biographers realizes, realized that he thinks uh, Hitler may have had some social democratic sympathies at the end of his military career. When you uh, uh, look at some of his biographical details, uh, really, if you scrutinize them really carefully, um, you know, so that, that kind of switching allegiances, um, you know, isn't, isn't necessarily all that uncommon in that regard. Um, however, uh, Finkelstein, you know, part of what I li like about what he's written about this is he is, he has, uh, he's deeply concerned about uh, Trump. That, that's very clear in his public statements. Um, but he's very cautious about whether to claim that he feels Trump actually crossed the line from populism, right-wing populism into fascism, right? Um and, you know, I've heard him say, so the book, you know, he published, right, I think as Donald Trump was running for president, right, but, you know, hadn't quite wrote one. And then the new edition has like a new foreword or something on it, but he doesn't really, you know, treat Trump fully in the book. And when I've heard him speak at different points, and it's like he inches, he, he's like, well, this is starting to sound more fascistic to me as time goes on is kind of his take. Uh, and, and, you know, I think a lot of people felt that way about the January 6th uh, riots at the Capitol, right? I mean, you had, you know, uh, you know, you had neo-Nazis with neo-Nazi tattoos all over their bodies running around the Capitol, um, you know, and, and, and so on. And, and that was the kind of um, political violence, right? Egged on by a political leader that some people, Fear. But this is, you know, Alex uh, Finkelstein, the, the bottom line is he's kind of, he's been a fence sitter, you know, about Trump. You yeah. know, is he a fascist or is he not? And the debate has kind of become this, uh, you know, it, it's, it's almost interminable. It like goes on and on, right? With you have certain figures arguing uh, that, that he is a fascist. Others who are even critical of Trump are like, no, he's definitely not, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and you, and you could run down some real famous intellectuals who, who weigh in on this, like uh, Jason Stanley, who's a philosopher at Yale. You know, he is a very firmly in the camp that Trump is a fascist and, from, you know, part of a fascist tradition. Um, Samuel Moyen, who, oh, he's a big fancy intellectual historian at one of the Ivy League universities. I can't remember <laughs> Aren't they one. all? <laughs> yeah. All the big um, leaders, all the but, Ivy Leagues. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <And> <laughs> And Samuel Moyen, who is a left-wing thinker, uh, came out very clearly and said, no, you know, I don't think Trump's a fascist and I don't think it's very useful for people to be saying that he is one because he argues that those who are most invested in call labeling Trump a fascist are those who want some kind of a, a restoration of a pre-Trump status quo. And he argues, uh, you know, that doesn't address any of the problems that led to Trump in the first place, you know. Um, you have thinkers like Robert Paxton, who's this now aging scholar of uh, World War II um, and fascism expert. You know, he's written about fascism all these years. When I was in college in the 90s, we read Robert Paxton, right? You know? <laughs> um, you know, and he said for most of Trump's presidency, no, he's not a fascist because the one thing he doesn't have that all fascist regime has had was a paramilitary organization at his disposal, right? The way the Nazis had the stormtroopers, you know, the SA or Mussolini had the squadristi. Um, and then after January 6th, he's like, oh, now I think he's a fascist, right? Because the the raid on the Capitol, which, uh, it, you know, and Moyn would say, no, 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 right? Like Hitler had millions of people, paramilitaries following him uh, when he rose to power. And this is like a spontaneous, you know, thing kind of organized on social media. You know, so the debate is, is, is kind of endless. Um, the, the person who on Trump, I think, may have come up with the term that I like the best, if you're trying to pin me down, uh, is, and I don't agree with all of his ideas generally, but um, about Trump or the current age, you know, I, I tend to like um, uh, Finkelstein generally more than him. But uh, Timothy Snyder introduced this term uh, pre-fascism. Um, and what I like about the term pre-fascism is that it's a little bit less focused on Trump as an individual. You know, like it's really hard for me to know what 
a figure like Donald Trump wants. I mean, he's very erratic. Um, I think he's mostly self-interested. Um, he seems to have certain authoritarian or, 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 or fascistic personality traits, right? He doesn't seem to care much about the rule of law and so on. But what about the storm, right, that followed Trump around, right? What about these far right domestic terror groups who felt, whether rightly or wrongly, felt egged on and empowered by the rise of Donald Trump? What about the introduction of mass disinformation in our politics? What about um, this us versus them politics that kind of came with the age of Donald Trump? What does that mean for our future? And what I like about Timothy Snyder's term of pre-fascism is it means the future isn't determined yet, right? Like I think we are in an incredibly dangerous moment, right? And I think the ground, uh, not just by Trump, but for Trump was a big part of it, right? But I think the ground has really been softened, right? Uh, uh, you know, our liberal democracy, our institutions, um, you know, are, you know, showing these, these flashing red lights. Uh, and, you know, uh, this argument that maybe we're in this pre-fascist state that we've got um, a type of politics that has fascistic tendencies, especially around truth and disinformation, us versus them politics, ultranationalism, an increasing willingness to tolerate political violence, you know, and violations of the rule of law, right? Um, and are we gonna be able to pull ourselves back from it? Uh, and, and I think that's the bigger question. And Snyder is also willing to delve into United States history and all of this, right? That we've had other pre-fascist moments in his opinion, right? One pre-fascist moment was the, uh, you know, the introduction of Jim Crow laws in the American South in the late 19th century, right? Um, which were challenged by the civil rights movement in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. Um, and uh, that was a moment of pre-fascism. Uh, that was a moment that caused a uh, massive amount of human suffering um, that hasn't totally been undone. But you also saw, you know, in, you know, an incredibly powerful movement that challenged that pre-fascist mo moment. Uh, I don't, you know, whether pre-fascism applies to late 19th century United States or not, I don't know. That's kind of, that, that, that's something that I would have to see proven a little bit more rigorously but I'm kind of intrigued by his idea right, in, in that regard. Um, and I've, you know, I've seen on the right that there's been the arguments that if you would like to put Trump in kind of that bubble of kind of getting us there in a way that and we've seen and, you know, I think one of our safeguards is that we're not a true democracy that we're mm -hmm. a republic. And that is definitely something where we've seen more true democracies becoming susceptible to um, that situation because they have to create coalitions in order to have a successful government where our two party republic kind of cr forces us to create coalitions within two parties. So it's, yep. you know, we have a little more protections and our founders kind of saw maybe not fascism, but in certain ways that this could be dismantled. And they studied Greece and Rome in the way that factionism can ultimately be the end of democracy. And the only thing that comes out of that is totalitarianism. So, and I've seen certain people saying that we have been inching closer to this in terms of the way that we have had cult of personality presidents and Trump definitely, um, he falls into definitely the cult of personality president, but we had, you know, I, I, a lot of people say it starts with um, FDR and a lot of people, FDR was definitely a cult of personality president. He had uh, three terms. Uh, he was there for 12 years, died in office and but he played on um, depression. He played on the war. He had those types of things going. He used internment camps. And all of this was in a way to play on the people's emotions and a slightly us versus them, but not necessarily internally, but an external us versus them. We had Ronald Reagan with the Cold War and communism. Again, not as much in the extreme that we're seeing it, but inching closer. And then right before Donald Trump, we had Barack Obama, who gave a rise to bringing back some of the things that we saw in civil rights, but the Black Lives Matter movement was created there. And it definitely created kind of an us for them and gave the birth of certain um, uh, styles of thinking in terms of uh, conservatives will say critical race theory has been introduced big time into academia and into a way we try and think. 
So a lot of people have been saying that he's just another step. He's another cult of personality into where we're going. Who knows? But we're just getting more extreme with each cult of personality president. Um, President Biden, I don't think falls into that because I don't think President Biden has the following that an Obama, that a Reagan, that an FDR, that a Trump had, because uh, we can't forget that Obama had people fainting at his rallies. He had a lot of people gushing over him, and he definitely had a movement. He had a classical sign, the love sign, changed to hope with his face on it. So there was some um, different things, and I think you can see some radicalization that came out of all four of those men. Um whether and further on their sides. So um, the argument has been that he's not necessarily a fascist, but that it's more of just a cult of personality. And it's become a very big part of our politics in America, where the cult of personality guy speaks to the woes of their side and really rises them up and creates that big movement. Yeah, I think we're, um, you know, I think uh, what you're, I, I, I view things a little bit differently in that I think, um, you know, if you, you look at United States politics, I think you're um, uh, pushing things uh, that are a little bit different and pushing them together. And, and, the, and so one, one issue that you're dealing with is that we have a government that was created with a very strong executive branch. And over time, that executive branch has become more and more powerful uh, with each success, successive president it seems that the presidency uses more executive authority to do things. In some cases, that's due to, um, you know, polarization, uh, making it impossible for Congress to act and do its job. In other cases, you know, you've had, uh, you know, like Dick Cheney's uh, unitary, uh, you know, notion of a unitary presidency and so on. Um, you know, the, I guess it's been ideological is what I'm trying to say in other cases. So you've got a strong executive branch and that executive branch, you know, is, is certainly open to exploitation in different holders of the office to interpret the role uh, differently. Number two, what you're commenting on is how the American presidency has become uh, something in the age, especially of 20th century modernization, you know, the consumerist society in which the United States has become, right? Uh, if you're going to be able to run for president, you have to have, um, you have to be charismatic. It's almost become a requirement for the job. Yep. Uh, even Biden, who's not particularly a, a charismatic person, he kind of ran on being the anti-Trump rather than, and that rarely works, by the way, you know. Fair um, to say to Joe Biden, not currently as charismatic. Throughout yeah. his 40 he used to be. half a century yeah. <laughs> extremely charismatic senator. exactly we all age so not yeah. to hold that against joe biden <laughs> exactly he used to be a more charismatic figure yes. but um you know the first time he ran for president um he, he probably had more 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 charisma than, than he than he's viewed as having today yep. <laughs> but in any case i you know i think what you're commenting on there is something that's a little bit different than a fascist type cult of personality in that we um we have actors who become president. We have, you know, reality stars who become president. Um, Obama was this just incredibly, you know, magnetic and electric, um, you know, personality. Bill Clinton kind of fits that mold as well. Um, John F. Kennedy, uh, you know, Dwight Eisenhower. Um, you have a lot of these modern, you know, FDR was incredibly charismatic. So charisma doesn't necessarily lead to, you know, fascistic or authoritarian cult of personality. And I think, you know, if you're comparing Barack Obama to Donald Trump, Barack Obama was very charismatic. You know, there was uh, certainly a lot of, you know, symbolism around his presidency that, that filled people with idealism and hope. And, you know, a lot of weight was put onto him um, and, and, and so on. But Barack Obama uh, governed and was guided as an institutionalist, first and foremost. I mean, he certainly, some people, a lot of conservatives didn't like some of his executive orders and were ideologically opposed to a few of the things he did. But he was, at, you know, actually governed as a very centrist um, and pretty moderate democratic president in a lot of ways. Um, and, you know, so... 
you know, I, I, I would see a very clear difference between his approach and the approach of Trump, which was to kind of trample on things, to ignore the rule of law. Um, you know, he was much more unprecedented in how he handled himself, um, whether you think he was a fascist or not, you know, or whether you think he's a populist or not. Um, uh, then uh, the, the other thing I'd just like to comment on is, is the BLM movement. Sure. Um, I, you know, I don't really view the Black Lives Matter movement uh, for the most part as a particularly uh, radical movement. Um, I think at its core, it's a movement that's in favor of racial equality. It opposes, uh, you know, police brutality. And I actually think what happened this summer was that you had a very incredibly broad coalition that it attracted. I mean, it was, uh, you know, you know, racially diverse and you had people marching in BLM protests that you never thought would be there. Um, and uh, certainly there were um, things that happened that a lot of conservatives didn't like. There were things that happened that created, um, you know, disorder in certain neighborhoods of city cities, but the vast majority of these protests were very peaceful. And actually I think the thing that, um, made them far more chaotic was a um, the the behavior of a lot of police forces, quite frankly, um, where they were very violent toward um, protesters and kind of helped uh, throw gasoline on the fire, so to speak, and not to mention the president who, uh, who, who did the same. Um, and that was, uh, you know, I think the thing that pushed a lot of these protests into a slightly different direction, but like anything else, we live in this age of polarization. So you're, you're always, you know, you're always going to have, uh, you know, a commentator who's going to, you know, offer an alternative narrative of these protests. And I just want to say in terms of BLM myself, we, I think need to and should separate those who did commit the violence as basically, I don't feel like many of those were the people that were marching and believing in the movement, I feel like a lot of them were opportunist. And I feel like that happens in a lot of these types of movements where you just have opportunists that see moments that are agitators that aren't necessarily out there to further the cause are out there to just create chaos. And that's an unfortunate thing in any of these movements that have any sort of noble backing. Um, And that's the only reason I didn't bring up BLM as the movement in terms of, of saying that the movement itself is right, but that some of the acts that occurred by opportunist people was a radical sure. result of the protests. So, sure, sure. All right. So, let's jump into a topic that I know is near and dear to your heart <laughs> and could directly affect you, which I hope doesn't directly affect anybody in that department because I think you've heard my admiration for that department already yeah. at the beginning of the show. But um, currently, the state of higher education and essentially a lot of the cuts and the layoffs that have been occurring. Um, even before the pandemic occurred, a lot of it will be blamed on the pandemic, which it definitely amplified it. But even before the pandemic, when we had um, basically recovery from the last recession and it, just all of this steamrolling, what is your position and your stance and why is it occurring? Uh, my stance about why um, higher ed is in trouble or um, what, what should be done about it, I guess. <laughs> I guess all the above. Go for it. <laughs> okay. Um, I think uh, the main reason, well, well, there are multiple reasons why higher ed is in trouble. Um, number one, uh, at, at the root of the problem is a gradual um, pulling back of investment in state universities. So that, you know, and I work at a private college so that the problems of private colleges are different. Yep. But um, the uh, amount of funding for state universities has gradually uh, and drastically declined over the last 20, 30 years, you know, whereas they used to, the states used to um, fund, you know, 60, 70, 80% of the cost of educating each student. Uh, that number is often down to, uh, you know, 20, 25%, 30%. And that's just a massive pulling back of uh, a commitment to, uh, you know, higher education that can be provided to everyone. Yep. Uh, so that's at the root of the problem. I mean, higher ed is falling apart because of a lack of investment. Um, there are other reasons too. Um, so some of them, ha- w- I would say the second most important thing that affects state and coll- uh, private colleges alike is there has been um, 
a decline, especially in the Northeast of um, kind of white middle-class students who typically pay college tuition, right? And so if you look at high school graduates, uh, there was one demographic cliff that we kind of went over, I think, um, 10 years ago, and then there was a slight recovery. It happened to coincide with the, with the Great Recession, which was really bad. Yeah. And then there was a slight recovery, but it looks as if we've got another one coming our way uh, in the 2020s, in the coming decade, which is also poorly timed with the, the pandemic. And so uh, if, you're, if you've got fewer of the students that you usually recruit to go to college available to you, you know, how do you recruit new students? You know, where do you find them? Do you, you can go into other regions of the country and recruit there. But what's at the core of the problem is a failure, especially, and this is particularly true in private colleges, is a failure to properly uh, diversify um, and to uh, by, by being a lot of private colleges have essentially remained predominantly white institutions uh, in all of their efforts at uh, creating more diversity, at creating more inclusion, more equity, uh, more education um, about, uh, you know, uh, various issues involving um, uh, race, efforts at creating a a warmer and and more welcoming environment to people from uh, a a wide array of backgrounds, they have all largely failed, right? And these institutions have still remained predominantly white institutions, right? And so uh, if colleges had historically done a better, a lot of private colleges had historically done a better job there, I think we'd be better off. Um, The final issue is a a pure, I think, uh, failure in economic planning, and that is uh, in the 1990s, 80, late 80s, 90s, every single college uh, decided that the thing they had to do was to create a Disneyland campus. Um, that meant you had to have uh, just absolutely gorgeous buildings on your campus. You had to have beautiful dorms. You had to have pristine athletic facilities. You had to have an athletic program that was competing in multiple sports. You had to have a football team and a basketball team that provided entertainments. Um, You had to have a, you know, a stupendous dining hall with all sorts of different options. Um, And all of that cost an enormous amount of money and it cost, uh, it it was a, and it was a huge investment in brick and mortar campuses. Right. Uh, And, That led to uh, a pulling back of investment in academic education. It led to uh, a watering down of the faculty. It led to an increasing reliance on part-time and adjunct faculty to teach classes rather than full-time faculty. It led to an erosion of tenure. And so we find ourselves in the midst of this pandemic that's created a financial crisis, the demographic problems that I've described, Um, And these colleges are just swimming in debt with all of these uh, buildings that they've built. They're overpriced athletic programs, and they've already watered down the academic product to the point that if you water it down anymore, then what are college students paying for anymore? Um, And so that's, that's kind of the contours of the problem. So, you know, I'll tell you just from, I'm 32 years old. I went through Marist College, finished in 2012. So I'm still fairly fresh in terms of time-wise from being away from school. And I can tell you just in my short time, this is a personal experience, that attitude towards college has changed. Um, A lot of the ways is the cost has continually gone up. And it's definitely to a lot of things of what you spoke on of why tuition has risen. Another thing that nobody prepares people for is how expensive buying books are for students that don't have any money. And they're asking people now, I hear certain people saying they have to spend almost a thousand dollars in just buying books and you have um, rental programs coming up and even schools try to work with renting, but they're only cutting half the price. So that's part of it. I think that people, as they go through school, They look back at other people and say, you can get all you want, but can you afford this, this, and this? And that kind of turns people off. I think a rising back in um, interest in the trades is another thing that has definitely cut into um, higher education in terms of your traditional college. And I, I really just think that 
the generation, my parents were very much told your kids have to go to school in order to get a job. They have to go to school in order to get a good job. And a lot of us did go to school. And I can't speak for many because I did what I did to myself in my educational sphere. And I'm not going to talk about that. But <laughs> um, I, but I, in the end, I do have a bachelor's degree in history and I am a union insulator. So it's a lot of the situation where a lot of people are sitting there and watching themselves get your traditional liberal arts, your sociologies, your um, psychologies, and they don't have necessarily the jobs for them. There's not enough of them. There's not enough of a calling for those jobs. And it's becoming difficult for people to sit there and then turn around and tell their kids, go to school for that too. And it's, it's, a, it's a difficult situation that's compounding on itself. And I feel like just an attitude towards school with, and they continue to raise their tuition. And it's a difficult situation for all because there are fantastic educators inside the educational sphere that deserve to have people that want to go there, that want to learn. And I just feel like kind of what you said, the institutions have definitely tried to paint a golden um, plated look about themselves Mm -hmm. without uh, giving you what you pay for in that substance. You know, most schools that are charging 50, $60,000 a year, you're not getting, you're getting a great education. Don't get me wrong, but you're not getting an education that should be costing as much money as it does. I think the price of schooling is a big factor in it right now. Yeah, um, I'm certainly sympathetic to that. And I think student loan debt, uh, you know, is a massive problem, right? I think um, as a country, we need to find ways in which we can reduce uh, how many student loans get taken taken out. Now, uh, my college president wouldn't like uh, the best solution to that, and that is to fund state education more. You know, because if, if state education becomes stronger, then Marist has more trouble <laughs> competing for students, you know. Um, but I think that's the first area where you have to address the issue. I mean, you, you should be able to have a state education that um, is fully staffed with full-time faculty and affordable. And I think states should invest in that. I think it's worth it. I think societies that have educated citizens uh, are more productive societies. They're more democratic societies. They're more economically vibrant. Um, now, the a quick um, question for you, yep. because you're a professor at a private institution. Yes. What uh, do you say you about the stigma that goes into your public higher education versus your private higher education? Because growing up, it was always yeah. state schools aren't as good as your private schools. Your best private schools will always trump your best state schools. And that was kind of just something going through high school that was just known. And I don't want you to get yourself in trouble because we are, yeah. you are a professor at a fantastic <laughs> private institution that, you know, if you work your yeah. tail off, you do, you do get the bang out of your buck for going to Marist yeah. college. Well, but, and yeah, and I'll, and, and I really, you know, and I don't want to come off as I, I believe in Marist. I mean, I yeah, believe absolutely. a great job. And I think, um, I got my diploma right up my, yeah. <laughs> right up there. it's there. <laughs> uh, and I think it's worth it. You know, I ultimately think it's worth it. And I think getting a history degree is worth it. I think, yes. um, you know, there are things that, uh, you know, so, so addressing the stigma. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I you know, I, w- I wish there weren't a, a stigma. I mean, I wish, uh, I, I think, I actually think the, Su- the Sunni system provides, a, in many cases, a tremendous education still. Yeah. I think they need more resources. Um, I know my colleagues who work there are overworked and underpaid. Um, and, uh, you know, I, you know, if you infuse the Sunni system with resources, it would, um, it would be an economic generator for the state. You know, I'll, I'll say that. And I think it would help a lot of people. And I, and I do think like, uh, as you said, people are changing their attitudes and people are bargain hunting more and so on. So I think some of that stigma might, might eventually be, be erased to a degree, but don't get me wrong. I think, um, I do think college is worth it. I think getting a college degree is valuable. I think when you look at all the statistics, people with a college degree still tend to do better, a lot better than people without one uh, in the economy. The, the problem that we're facing is that uh, they're not doing, college graduates aren't doing as well as college graduates used to do, right? Because the, the economy is increasingly serving, uh, you know, a narrower and narrower group of people, right? And it's crowding, you know, some of these college graduates down into lower paying jobs, and they're not able to always pay off their student debt. And so it's a challenge for us as educators to adjust to that. 
Um, but I do think a reprioritization at private colleges as well as state universities where um, you invest less in physical plant, less in uh, athletics, as fun as they are, and I love athletics, um, less in um, some of the, uh, I guess, uh, surface elements of the education and devote more to the nuts and bolts uh, educating that gets done. And I'll tell you, Alex, us humanities professors, we're cheap dates. We don't make as much as other faculty members. Uh, you know, we work very hard. We give a lot of service to the institution. These institutions get their money's worth with us. And I think, um, you know, if there, were, if there were more of us, we could make an even bigger difference. Um, and so it's n never easy for an administrator to balance the budget. You know, it, it, it's, it's, it's hard work and it's really hard work being a leader in the current pandemic and the economic pressures that go with that. But, um, you know, but, you know, I, I have hope that Marist uh, will innovate. I have a lot of faith in the Marist faculty to get us through this crisis and, and um, adjust to a lot of these kind of new and harsh realities that we're facing. But I think in order to do that, institutions like Marist need to retain their commitment uh, to their faculty, to respecting um, the work that the faculty do, to respecting their contracts, to respecting tenure, to keeping tenure in place and not to be uh, attempted to erode it, to not, uh, and I think adjunct and part-time and non-tenure uh, track faculty make tremendous contributions to Marist as well. And I think they should be well treated also. I'd like to see, you know, part-time salaries improve a little bit so we don't lose our value part-time faculty members. I'd like to see our lectures, you know, given a, a little bit more job security and things like that. And I think if you value your, value your faculty, um, they're going to be the ones who get you out of this pickle. You know, you treat them like uh, you're invested in them. Uh, they will innovate and help you get through the crisis. Now, uh, bringing this back to a little more of a politics spectrum, because this is a political podcast sure. as well. Um, there is a definite conservative crusade against higher education. Yeah. Um, that is not a secret. I'm not letting out anything big. And if you don't know that, then you kind of haven't been paying attention. Hmm. One of the things that they do say is that being a conservative on a college campus is damn near impossible if you're an outgoing conservative. If you express your views, and especially during the four years of Trump, if you associated with Donald Trump in any way, it was very difficult to be a conservative and open conservative on a college campus. Um, I feel like that has something to play with in the decline, where as more conservatives have become to speak out against the higher education institutions, discriminating against conservative theory, you have a lot more conservative parents and kids that identify as conservatives not wanting to go. Um, I, I'm not accusing you at all because I know you and I know you are not discriminatory in any which way. You embrace the debate against another ideology. Um, but is there any correlation across academia, not at Marist College? Because again, I'll speak for that whole entire history department. You can be a conservative and debate anybody there or whatever you want to be. You could be a totalitarian authoritarian and they will sit down and say, OK, this is why I think you're wrong. Why are you right? And there's a, a good educational debate there. But have you seen anything across academia that s supports the fact that being a conservative on a college campus, an open conservative, is not um, is frowned upon? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, well, first of all, I think Marist is an interesting place in that it does have, a, I mean, it has a lot of conservative students, you know. It does. Uh, yes. Uh, and so it's certainly an example of a place with. Uh, Certainly the liberal arts faculty are pretty left-leaning, right? And you've got a lot of conservative students and mm -hmm. sometimes there's tension. Um, but usually I, I don't think the conservative students walk away feeling like they're unwelcome on campus. Uh, the, the students who tend to feel, uh, ha have the most trouble in my experience are, um, are uh, students of color or students who kind of struggle um, kind of fitting in culturally if they're not from, you know, Long Island or New Jersey or something like that. Uh, <laughs> but uh, Northern um, New but Jersey. conservatives make that seem caveat. to do pretty, pr pr pretty well. <laughs> and so I think a lot of it has to do with the culture of the student body as much as with the faculty themselves. You know, Marist faculty isn't all that different from other institutions, but there are other institutions where, uh, a lot of the students are very progressive and uh, sometimes, you know, conservative student might have trouble fitting in, making friends, feeling that like they can speak their mind. Um, 
I, I tend to think that particular problem gets a bit overblown um, in conservative media, but I certainly have heard about instances where I think uh, certain lines have been crossed in, in calling, calling people out and, um, you know, you, you know, you, people feeling that they can't engage in, in intellectual debate is, is never a good thing. Right. And so that, it, um, you know, and I needs to be kept on that. Uh, you know, as, as far as the whole free speech debate goes, um, you know, I tend to be far more concerned about kind of the, the racism and vitriol that gets spat out on social media at, you know, uh, journalists of color, women journalists, uh, Jewish journalists who are exposed to, you know, kind of racism, misogyny, and anti-Semitism than I am about, um, you know, uh, people being silenced because they have conservative viewpoints. But uh, certainly it is the case that sometimes people who want to think out of the box uh, feel like they've got a, you know, sense of themselves and that kind of thing. And, and, and so we do need to be conscious of that. Definitely. All right, Professor. I really appreciate you taking the time to come on. I had yeah, lots I was, of fun. I was Thank happy so to do so, Alex. Um, again, he is a professor of history, the absolutely great history department at Marist College. Uh, Dr. Michael O'Sullivan. Go buy his book, Disruptive Power: Catholic Women, Miracles, Politics in Modern Germany from 1918 to 1965. Professor, are you big on social media at all? Uh, I'm on Twitter, but I don't even can't even remember what my my Twitter handle is. <laughs> well, um, I'll do the I'll do the homework and I'll put it in the uh bio <laughs> at the bottom there about the episode. I will put your Twitter handle in there for you, but um, go follow him because if you don't tweet much, I imagine when you do tweet, it's something knowledgeable and should be paid attention to. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, the other the other thing I'll plug is sometimes I serve as a co-host on a podcast called New Books in German Studies. So if you're interested in some of the things you heard tonight i interview book authors about their ideas sometimes so uh, check awesome. out new books in german studies awesome again he's dr michael o'sullivan professor of history at maris college i'm alex cuesta host of the median really want to thank everybody for listening everyone have a good night